It is my pleasure to introduce the uh, distinguished speaker today, Professor Shankar Dashamas from the University of Maryland. Professor Dashamas is the uh, Richard E. Plank Chair in Physics and a distinguished university professor in the University of Maryland. And while he's um, well known in the field of condensed metaphysics, I think he's particularly well known for a numerous pub number of publications and, and, and also similar big number in citation. And, and nowadays, he's going to tell us something I think all these students at least are uh, excited about, what is uh, quantum reality. Yeah, Professor. Okay, Dashamas. thank you very much. And I thank IAS and Henry for asking me to give a talk, this talk. But I think it's a trick, I, because I think I'm now very nervous, because some of the world's greatest quantum mechanicians are sitting in the audience, which is not something I counted on. But the last moment I realized that uh, people like Patrick, Bert, Duncan, now Jason has shown up, Henry will be the audience. So I hope that there are a few things I'll tell you that even you do not know. So uh, I mean, mainly there is a whole, I think, um, kind of uh, scam going on out there, which kind of tries to convince you that quantum mechanics or quantum reality is something extremely mysterious, much, much more bizarre than a classical reality. And, um, and uh, uh, it's actually quite astonishing. I mean, Bert and I were in a conference last year where half a whole day was spent on uh, how incredibly uh, crazy quantum reality is. I personally actually find classical reality to be much, much more difficult to understand, but we'll get to that later. So as we know, the world around us seems classical, right? Uh, uh, laws are all well understood by 1900. Industrial revolution, electricity, uh, all of these things are based on classical laws, Newton's laws, a physical to MA, law of gravitation, that apple falls and the earth goes around the sun. They're all the same classical laws. Planets, bridges, bridges already existed in Roman time. Airplanes basically fly on classical Newton's laws. All the Newton probably would have been totally astonished seeing a 747 go 10,000 miles. Buildings, cars, boats, trains going to the moon essentially are all classical physics. They all follow Newton's laws of motion and gravitation, Maxwell's laws of electricity and so on, which are all understood by 1900. So it's. Uh, it's something we think we understand, partly because it has been around for 400 years. Uh, you know, intuition is uh, not a natural thing. Intuition is large, so we kind of feel that it's intuitive. Uh, but we know that the world is quantum, right? That's the ultimate interpretation of existence, and in some sense, the greatest intellectual achievement of, of mankind. We also know that quantum reduces to classical at macroscopic everyday level. Although the transition itself is not experimentally completely understood, and people still argue uh, exact role that decoherence plays, and, uh, and I'm going to come to that. I actually always thought that this issue is kind of resolved, and it was uh, mostly people like Einstein and Schrodinger who worried about it. Then about uh, 10 years ago, I found out that Tony Leggett, whom I came to know very well, uh, doesn't believe in quantum mechanics on a on a macroscopic level. It was a total shock for me. I mean, uh, you know, here is a case where I could not say he doesn't understand quantum mechanics. He understands it much, much better than I do, but he does not believe in, uh, in that the quantum world goes all the way to macroscopic reality. So the microscopic quantum world is, of course, different, strange and counterintuitive. We expect that because you are talking about the microscopic world, which is different. Um, you know, even in biologically, I'm sure the reality to an insect, to an ant, is very, very different from the reality that we see. So reality certainly de depends on scale. To say an electron's reality is very bizarre is really not saying much. Uh, not much more than saying the reality of a bacteria or a bee is very different from our reality. But we do know that there are all these bizarre things happen, like in quantum world going from A to B, Feynman told us that you have to go through all paths that take you from A to B, you know, in going from this point to that point, I have to go through different galaxies and some of our all those plots, each of those paths has a very specific amplitude that quantum mechanics allows us to calculate. You sum all of them. Of course, the paths are that very far, very non-classical, have very little amplitude, presumably. Then you have to add all of them, take the square, and then you get the classical probability. And it appears very bizarre, so Feynman said, it's in his book, that I think it is safe to say that no one understands quantum mechanics. I think, again, this is an exaggeration to 
kind of make a point. I'm sure Richard Feynman understood it very, very well. What he's basically saying that, you know, trying to explain it using classical words is very, very hard, which is, of course, true. Uh, none other than Schrodinger himself, in 1952, uh, he became kind of a philosopher of science, said that we never experiment with just one electron or one atom or small molecule. In thought experiments, we sometimes assume that we do. This invariably entails ridiculous, conse ridiculous consequences. There are two points to be made about that. One is that what Schrodinger was thinking about is that, you know, experimentally, in those days, certainly you're always doing ensemble measurements. So Schrodinger would have been shocked if he came today where, you know, working with one atom or electron is routine. In fact, the Nobel Prize two years ago was given for that. I'm going to come to that. So he's saying that it becomes ridiculous. Quantum reality, when you described in ordinary language, appears ridiculous simply because we don't do experiments with one electron, one atom, which we know is not true. 1952, that was true. That was 60 years ago. But now doing experiments with one atom is routine. Uh, here is Gelman saying Niels Bohr brainwashed a whole generation of theorists into thinking that the job interpreting quantum theory is done 50 years ago. Uh, and he's trying to say there is something mysterious about it. But I can tell you he doesn't believe that it's mysterious because I was in a conference with him last year and he certainly was very vehement in saying there is nothing mysterious about quantum mechanics. It's all understood. Uh, here are statements for Heisenberg. What you observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to a method of questioning. So he's saying uh, it's a pure phenomenology. You know, we do not know how, what nature is. We only have an algorithm, and we understand that algorithm, that algorithm is quantum mechanics. Schrodinger, um, uh, Heisenberg certainly believed in that, that um, quantum mechanics is an algorithm that nature seems to obey. So, and the basic point is this continuous reduction of the wave packets, which cannot be derived from Schrodinger's equation, is a consequence of transition from the possible to the actual. So quantum mechanics, on the other hand, is the most successful theory ever conceived by homo sapiens. I mean, what I mean by that is that in the 88-year history of its existence, there has been no documented violation of the theoretical predictions, and the theory has not been verified to an incredible 14 decimal places. I'm thinking of G minus two experiments uh, in atomic physics, where they keep on going to more and more decimal places. And as they do, Kinoshita keeps on expanding the QED calculations with his Japanese colleagues by one more decimal places. It's an, it's an astonishing theory experiment coming together thing. I mean, I had to actually learn it recently because I'm trying to do this in graphene, going to three fold loops. And it's incredible what they have done. And of course, they have an advantage that we don't have in graphene. Alpha is one over 137. So we can go to 137th order. So up to 137 decimal places, theory and experiment will agree, maybe even more. But in graphene, it doesn't agree even in the first decimal place because asymptotic series diverges probably in the second order we are finding. But it's, you know, it's incredible. There is nothing else like this anywhere. 14 decimal places of agreement between theory and experiment. Electrical resistance and voltage standards are now defined by quantum Hall and Josephson effects, which are defined by, I should put quote mark here. It's really not definition, but, but for all purposes, it's definition of ohm is now by quantum Hall effect and of volt by Josephson effect to quintessential macroscopic quantum Hall phenomena. In fact, we just heard a talk, beautiful talk, by Bert Halperin on fractional quantum Hall effect. Atomic clocks work at an incredible precision of one part into the power 15 because of our control over atoms. It's probably going to go, thanks to June East, soon to one part into the power 18. They keep on making advances. So this is, you know, we may or may not understand it intuitively, but it works to an unbelievable precision. Uh, simple things that we know, colors of various stones and so on, solar spectrum, if you want to understand them, you have to use quantum mechanics because they're all connected with atomic spectra. And actually, classically, atomic spectra can be explained. You can go back and look at the papers in end of 19th century. Classical spectra actually was explained using harmonic oscillator wave function. But there is incredible amount of fine tuning they had to do. And it's not a natural explanation. It's untrue that it cannot be explained, but the explanation is not natural at all. It becomes very natural when you use even Bohr atom of quantum physics. Of course, with full quantum mechanics, it becomes very natural. And of course, modern technology is based entirely on the quantum. Transistors work because they have electrons and holes. Holes exist because we have quantum mechanics, magnetic disks, superconductors, lasers. Even something like drug manufacturing has become quantum mechanical. It's, it's not very well known. Uh, that drug companies spend a huge amount of money on big computers to do quantum chemistry calculations first. They do this 
LDA car party and low type calculations, uh, they are actually among the largest users of quantum uh, of, of computing time. And the reason is that um, clinical trials of drugs are very, very expensive, okay? So what you do not want to make all possible kind of drugs and test them because that's going to cost huge amount of money. So it's much better to buy a huge computer, hire some quantum chemist, and kind of reduce the phase space by doing quantum chemistry calculations first. I don't know the details because almost all of it is proprietary. And, and they do all these you know, molecular dynamics for the classical part, that quantum mechanics, reduce kind of the phase space, then make the drugs for clinical trial, okay? So these are all possible because the world is quantum. Even the difference between metals and insulators are quantum phenomena. I'm not going to explain it in details, but it's, you know, you'd not have, in classical physics, you cannot have metals and insulators. All these pictures that you see, none of them would be possible if the world was not quantum. So, you know, on the one hand, quantum is very mysterious. All these tall words, Feynman is telling us nobody understands it. But on the other hand, a lot of people are making a huge amount of money without even understanding it. Because as you know, this is iPhone, Apple stocks are very, very expensive, and all these things because the world is quantum mechanics. So this is, you know, this is the, uh, the conductivity of a conductor versus an insulator differ by a factor of trillion, trillion, something that comes about 22. It's the largest dimensionless number that you can find in just ordinary life. Everybody knows what a conductor is, you get an electrical shock if you touch it, and what an insulator is, you don't get an electrical shock. It's very, very well known. And if you just take the ratio of the conductivity, dimensionless number is about 22. It's among all the natural things, it's you know, the largest one. And no combination of natural classical constants is going to give you 10 to the power 22. So you want to form a dimensionless constant from you know, classical constants, you can't. Okay, so the point is that this was understood by, by stalwarts, you know, so Drew, they made up a model of little billiard balls moving around, which turned out to be electron, and he said, well, you know, in, in metals they move around, insulators they don't move around. We, of course, know now because of quantum mechanics is the first, among the very first, right after atomic physics, among the very first successful application of uh, quantum mechanics, people like Bloch, Slater, uh, Hartree, Falk, Wigner, worked very hard, bought, very hard between 1928 and 1935, establishing that the you know, difference between metals and insulators arise from this band gap. Metals do not have band gap at Fermi level, electrons, do, uh, semiconductors do, and this band gap being of the order of a few volt, you, uh, in metals, electrons can move around easily, conducting electricity and insulators they cannot. You have to have a very large voltage, then if a breakdown, all the bands will kind of shift and think there will be a tunneling and, and the thing will uh, break down. Transistors, of course, are the heart of modern technology. Without transistors, there is nothing, not my computer, not iPhone, nothing. And uh, Wolfgang Pauli had lots of comments from very famous people. Wolfgang Pauli uh, apparently said, it's within direct quote, one shouldn't work on semiconductors this is a filthy mess. Who knows if they exist? Next sentence I didn't quote said, although I invented them, okay? So he was a very modest man. Uh, and and um, basically what happened, what he's talking about is the semiconductors are predicted doing band structure calculation. There are materials which are, you know, the band gap is not very large like a diamond and not very small uh, and not zero like a metal where you should be able to excite some electrons and they should move around. And people even realize that uh, if you have them, you can use them from technology, for technology. You know, I mean, all these things were realized already by this time. So silicon, they already kind of knew that silicon should be a semiconductor just from the electronic structure of silicon atom. But experiments uh, did not agree with each other. It's, it's somewhat like what happens in any new subject in today's research in, in solid state physics. You know, you, you, somebody sees it, like today, Bert Halperin told us that new is equal to half fractional quantum Hall effect has been seen, but by one group working in Geneva. Nobody else has seen it. It has not been seen in Columbia. It has not been seen at Harvard, but it has been seen in University of Geneva. And this sort of thing happens in a new subject. You know, you, you cannot reproduce, something is wrong. So uh, the study of semiconductor was totally dominated by this sort of artifacts. The reason was people didn't realize that the surface is filled with impurities. And the key to doing semiconductor transport measurements is to clean the surface, surfaces. And it took many, many years, uh, 30 years, before silicon MOS came in. The first transistors turned out to be point conduct transistors. And the reason is there is, not that there is anything wrong 
with semiconductor, as Pauli kind of implied. It's simply because you did not know enough about surface physics and that experimental tools had to be developed. You know, very little, you know, almost nothing happens in life because theorists uh, have figured it out. You have to have the right tools to look at it. And when people looked at it, the right tools, they realized that the surface is filled with, uh, with, with impurities, which are providing levels in the band gap for electrons to move around so semiconductors are not behaving the way they should behave. And it took more than 30 years for the actual tools and the techniques and the materials <laughs> to develop. Now, of course, silicon has changed the world, right? So here is, um, I'm probably breaking some kind of, um, some kind of copyright uh, uh, law by showing this. Uh, but I pretend that I didn't see that little thing. That, so this is a picture of Pentium chip, not of today, something like five, six years ago. So this chip is the actual size here. You know, as you know, it's the, like this. And then it's magnified up to 1,000 times. And uh, now it's, um, this chip of this size has one billion transistors. One billion in a, in a, in a little, a few millimeter by a few millimeter size. It's, it, it, you know, it's called technology, it's called engineering. But it's one of the most amazing things that I have ever thought about. Just imagine a little thing like that where there are one billion different transistors and all of them are working because semiconductors have electrons on holes and all of them are working with sufficient accuracy, reliability, and precision that this computer works all over the world. I you know, never have any problem. Uh, eventually, one, of course, it will die, but probably not because this thing died. It probably will be because the magnetic disk uh, gives out. And this happens because of quantum physics. Electrons on holes are moving inside those transistors, uh, making everything possible. So all of you know about Moore's law, that, um, you know, that uh, the, the efficiency increasing every two years, but it's actually slowing down. It's now more like two and a half years, because eventually, at, uh, uh, I think I have the next slide, eventually around 2020, um, we, the node, they call these things node, will be 34 nanometer, three, roughly 300 angstroms. And eventually someday, it will become below 100 angstroms, and then it will be very dif difficult to keep up this, uh, this increase every two years, and, and nobody knows what's going to happen then. Um, here is uh, another way of looking at it. Calculation per second per thousands of dollars. That's really the th way to think about it, okay? So um, here is mechanical logic, and it has increased by up to 2,000 by eight orders of magnitude, and it has increased by another order of magnitude in 2014. I could not find a slide showing it. This is from this semiconductor roadmap that, um, that SRC uh, puts out. Um, so here is mechanical logic, just you know, hand calculators, electromechanical logic, vacuum tube logic, discrete transistor logic, integrated circuit, and um, you know, people thought many, many times it will come to an end, but it keeps on going exponentially up and it has increased by something like, uh, you can see the number. If you start with mechanical logic by something like 14 orders of magnitude, and even if you start from uh, just ordinary transistor, it has grown by something like uh, eight or nine orders <coughs> of magnitude. Uh, uh, there is no parallel to this in, in uh, technology anywhere, I have been told. Uh, it's, it's unique. If you think about bridge technology, you know, bridges are pretty advanced technology, right? We cross rivers, we do all kinds of things. Bridge technology has not advanced much after the Roman time. I mean, I'm, it's not like, it's a slight exaggeration. It has advanced, but not much. Meaning, you know, we have made better cantilevers, bridges can be wider, but there, there has not been a revolution. We cannot build a bridge that, you know, goes over Pacific Ocean, okay? But if bridge technology went like this, we could build bridges all around the earth without any problem, you know, if it increased. What? Oh, yeah, I do not know. I've never made any money out of it. I just copied. Yeah, I think this, that is taken into account. I think it is taken into account in this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think so. Yes, yes. Um, you know, it's also good to see where the size has come down to. By the time year 2000 came, we are already below size of a virus. Now we are way below size of a virus. So, you know, so uh, we should not denigrate. We physicists should not denigrate this thing calling its technology. It's, um, you know, very few things. Uh, achieve this level of, of uh, uh, wow factor. Every time, you know, they, are, they do all these things, optical lithography, and, and every time somebody puts a resolution limit, 
These engineers are smart enough to work around it. It is a cost per function. That also going down exponentially. This, of course, is what the driver is in, 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 in it. You know, driver is not basic engineering or physics. Nobody's trying to make a record going below the size of a virus. What they're trying to do is reduce the cost so that things become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. This is the original transistor. I actually saw it. It's in, it used to be, maybe it still is, in the lobby of the Bell Labs. I'm sure Patrick and Bart uh, Duncan have seen it. When I first saw it, and I almost had goosebumps, it's about that size, you know, about this size, okay? <laughs> it's soldered together like this. This is what uh, Bardin and Bratain, Bratain made in the laboratory with uh, active uh, collaboration with Bardin. It's a point conduct transistor. It's not, it's not a MOS, which is the heart of this thing. Um, and, and, uh, and this is where it all started. You know, it's held with, you see, held with safety pin. Uh, pretty amazing that this is 1948, okay? And then the first integrated circuit, 1958, okay? This is the one at um, uh, Fairchild Industries. So it's a piece of silicon, and they had this idea that uh, you can use this piece of silicon as many, many, many transistors, uh, monolithic integration. And uh, if you talk to the people who invented it, they thought that this will have a tremendous impact on radios, uh, that was where their imagination stopped. I recently did an interview, and, uh, and they said they never thought that it would have any impact outside uh, radio. So this is also real size. And now we are talking about sizes which have come down to, uh, uh, we are talking about, um, you know, now we are at a 34 nanometer, 340 angstroms node, and we will soon be at the 20 nanometer node, 200 angstrom, each transistor size. And the roadmap kind of ends somewhere here because obviously there is an ultimate limit here, size of one atom, probably size of something like 10 atoms, but it cannot go beyond that. And there's a huge subject, which is called you know, life beyond the roadmap, life beyond silicon. Even I got funding for seven years from that there. Anything that you can come up with, any crazy idea you can come up with, which has an on, off, on or off aspect, uh, a semiconductor research corporation is willing to fund it. So Alan McDonald and I <laughs> proposed that in graphing there could be interlayer coherence and that will give you on and off. And Alan is still funded, but they threw me out after I pointed out that disorder will be a very big problem. This thing is not going to work at all, unless you are at micro Kelvin, which is not going to help. And then they called me and said, okay, they don't need me anymore. Um, so you know, the real heart of today's technology, of course, is uh, CMOS where um, the, Quantum mechanics basically comes in by the fact that electrons are two-dimensional. They're near the surface because you have created a potential well to confine them. After that, or in gallium or sunday Fiti, again, the same thing. You have created electrons are near the surface. They are quantized into subbands, and so they move two-dimensionally around the surface without any scattering. So that's the only place where the quantum mechanics is coming in. After that, it's actually all classical because they, then all you do, this allows you to kind of keep on and off very precise and very fast because you're doing it electrically. Either you, either you have the electron or you don't, and so on and off is very easy, and then you just combine many of them, and uh, then it's just Boolean algebra. So it's just on and off, zero and one. Once you have zero and one, of course, you can build all of logic, all of arithmetic, all of internet. So quantum mechanics is not being used actively here, only passively, that you can have this on and off very easily because electrons are very near the surface, so you can do this cutoff very fast, and the ratio of the, you know, the voltage or the current to on and off is very, very small because of quantum mechanics. So one can say this is really not completely quantum mechanical. You know, it's quantum mechanical in the sense a magnet is quantum mechanical. We know that you will not have ferromagnetism without quantum mechanics. But of course, this is not natural. You had to make it, and making it, of course, you have to use quantum mechanics. It started with Breton and uh, Bardeen, and they obviously we're using quantum principles to make the first transistors. But you can ask the next question that can you somehow use the fact that in quantum mechanics, all states between zero and one are allowed. And that of course is what we call quantum computation. So it's a paradigm with four key ingredients. You need a Hilbert space. And classical bits, as I just told you, is just zero or one. Either you have zero or one. Each register is on, off, on, off. You can change it, but you can always have either on or off. But in quantum mechanics, of course, you can have linear combination of zero and one, so you can have everything in between. 
So in quantum based laser spin up and down, uh, you do not have to use as eigen state. You can just take a linear combination. The spin could point in any direction. So in principle, you can have everything. So a new feature of qubit would be that a linear combination of up and down gives you like spin sideways, but that's completely allowed. So this will be using quantum mechanics actively. So you know, it's like what Schrodinger told us, cat dead or alive both. You are taking a linear combination of that. So if you have a Hilbert space with many, many, many of these qubits, so these are qubits are each with two states that you can linearly combine. And it's, all you have to do is start with, so you need a Hilbert space of two level system. Then you start at the initial state where you know exactly what the state is. Let's say all states are up, all states are zero. Oops. Something happened here. Excuse me just for a moment. Well, okay, I think I'm going to explain the rest to you later. Yeah. And, and, and once you have this, yeah, well, because a little bit more needs to be stated for, for the non-experts, of course. Experts already know everything. So these are the only two things you need. If you have these things and you can use this linear combination, then you're using quantum mechanics actively and later on we'll see how that works. So let me give you a quick, very quick history of computation. Unary computation, you know, tablets are found in Mesopotamia and I'm sure um, <laughs> in China also along the rivers where people are already doing trades 10,000 years ago. And so you'll see little tablets with one written crossed out and basically, you know, I give you some bushels of corn, you give me some goats, that sort of thing was going on 10,000 years ago. So that was computation. People needed it for commerce. Uh, binary, somewhere along the line, zero was invented. And so uh, 1,000 years ago, we had binary zero and one. So you had bits already. So then you can do everything with just zero and one. So the concept of analog computer also existed about 1,000 years ago in, in China. You know, the abacus is an analog computer. It's a mechanical analog computer, but it has been around China for probably more than 1,000 years. You know, this is theorist. 1,000 means just 10 to the power three. So uh, George Bull first showed us how if you have, you know, zero and one, you can do everything, all of logic. Digital computers roughly kept 100 years ago, okay, 60 years ago, but I'm using powers of 10. Quantum mechanics also 100 years ago. So now the question is that if you look at this, uh, binary arithmetic kind of already existed 1,000 years ago because zero was invented. But it took almost 1,000 years for digital computers to come along. So quantum mechanics, is now, and we know a qubit is possible because of quantum mechanics. So if you extrapolate from that, in about a thousand years, we'll have a quantum computer, just if you use this logic. Uh, uh, and you know what? It probably is closer to the truth than what most people who are active participants in this business make you feel. But there is no known principle that said it cannot be done. Now that we know how to do quantum error correction, so there is no reason not to do physics on it. And I'm suddenly uh, rooting for it being 1,000 years away, because if it's just uh, 10 years away, no physicist will get funded for doing quantum computation. It'll become a pure engineering problem. Okay. So, but, but there is no principle that says it cannot be done, so maybe it can be done. Maybe we can hasten things. You know, in those days, they did not have technology. This was pre-industrial evolution, so maybe revolution, so maybe what took 900 years then could be done in 90 years now. Um, one of my fears, I should tell you, that this may turn out to be like fusion, like that promising assistant professor who will always do his great work five years down the line. You know, it's, uh, fusion has been always in the United States, just 10 years away from being uh, commercially viable. So I don't know if quantum computer will follow that or not. Let's hope not. So Feynman, in his beautiful book, The Character of Physical Laws, has this statement. I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. Very extreme statement. I am going to tell you what nature behaves like. If you simply admit it that maybe she does behave like this, you'll find her a delightful intrinsic things, thing. Do not keep saying to yourself if you can possibly avoid it, but how can it be like that? Because you'll get down the drain into a blind alley from which nobody has yet escaped. Nobody knows how it can really be like that. I think you are simplifying for lay people, uh, you know, obviously Richard Feynman understood quantum mechanics, but it seems to me, um, you know, I never asked him, I don't know if anybody did, it seems to me from this sentence that he was a um, phenomenologist who thought quantum mechanics is a recipe, an algorithm which works. 
Um, and and uh, you know, from this sentence, or it's possible that he's saying it just to uh, make an impact on, on uh, non-mathematical lay people because uh, Feynman understood quantum mechanics. <laughs> Einstein, who also understood quantum mechanics, obviously, uh, says this thing, which is very, very well known, this uh, quote from Einstein, subtle is the Lord, but Madisha says not. And he's, in the context in which he said this is this, quantum mechanics is very impressive, but an inner voice tells me that it is not yet the real thing, whatever he meant by real thing. I often use this expression, real thing. The theory produces a good deal, but hardly brings us closer to the secret of the old one. I'm at all events convinced that he does not play dice. And he's talking, of course, about the probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics, Copenhagen interpretation, and, and, and so on. I'm going to discuss these things more. To some extent, John Bell's 1965 paper resolved this uh, same year that uh, Feynman wrote the character of physical laws. I'm sure Feynman did not know about John Bell's work because nobody knew about John Bell's work. There's no citation to the paper at all in the first three years. So, so you know, so uh, uh, John Bell actually resolved these questions. He basically showed there is nothing there. It is what you see. You know, there is nothing deeper than what you see. It is exactly what you see because John Bell proved an inequality uh, that should be satisfied uh, uh, if there is something more, and it should be violated if there is nothing more. And as far as I know, experiments, unfortunately, mostly with photons, with massless objects, show that John Bell's inequality is always violated. So the world is quantum, and there is no deeper interpretation beyond that. So uh, you know the surprising after quantum mechanics, you know, principle of superposition, quantum entanglement, quantum uncertainty, and this wave function collapse, quantum jump, decoherence, these things. And these are, this is the thing that makes people uh, say, when people are saying they do not understand quantum mechanics, this is the aspect everybody is alluding to, okay? Which is connected with quantum entanglement because this is not in Schrodinger equation. This is added on. And for the non-expert, I'm quickly explain what one is talking about. Experts could go to sleep. This is as Yogi Berra said long time ago, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Yogi Berra was an American, is an American, was an American baseball player and kind of a folk hero, and um, he used to make these pronouncements, which are meanings on the surface, surface of it, on the face of it, but kind of funny. So he said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. But the point in the classical world, of course, when you come to a fork, you gotta choose which side of the fork you're gonna take. You cannot take both. So in classically, you can choose left, you can choose right, but you cannot choose both. But Yogi Berra told us that you can actually just take it. You can do both. So that's quantum physics. Both are allowed because the electron just breaks up, and this is because the electron is not us. The electron can be break up. If I come to a fork, my amplitude to go through both together is very, very small because I'm a very large mass macroscopic object. I'm connected to the environment, so I'm decohering all the time. But electron, the amplitudes to go through both, if you do a careful measurement, is large. So it will go through both uh, together. And we all know that if you do classical interference experiment, then what are going to see if you go through two holes that one hole gives you this probability, the other hole gives you two pr this probability. If you add that two, you're going to see something like this. Okay, this is what you get classically. Okay, if you shoot bullets or electrons through two holes randomly, quantum mechanically we know this is what you're going to get. Whether you do it with photons, this is classical wave, or with electrons. So, so because it's the amplitudes that add, not the not the probability. So uh, since the amplitude side, you can have both constructive and destructive interference, and you have to add all the paths together. There's the path integral. And so you can do this electron experiment. It has been done a long time ago. And this is actually what you see. This is just taken, taken from actual experiment. At first, you just see some dots. A few electrons are hit. You don't see anything. But eventually, lots of electrons come, come in. You see a pattern, and it's clearly not like the classical experiment at all. This is like what light does. It's an interference pattern builds up when you have large number of electrons hitting it. Uh, this is what happens. Now, why is it that I am not fuzzy or I'm not a quantum interference pattern or you are not? Because our sizes are large. So our wavelength is very, very small. So you cannot really do the interference measurement. And second thing is that we being macroscopic, you're totally connected to the outside world, to the sun through solar radiation because I'm a living object. I'm an open system. So a decoherence, we are not an isolated quantum system, so you cannot see quantum interference. So these are actual images from a long time ago. Now there are much better images. This is famous Hitachi experiment of Tonomura, 
as an experiment in Bologna, seeing this with electrons, seeing pure quantum interference pattern with electrons. Now, suppose you try to detect one of these, um, one of these, where it's going through. It's okay, electron is going through both. I'm going to put a detector right here to see how it's going through. Well, the electron somehow knows that it is being observed. Uh, you then see, you know, if you do that, you will only then see the classical pattern. You're not going to see the quantum interference. And, you know, the, so, so the basic thing is that it's always the, the amplitudes that are adding. And if you try to see which slit it's going through, the wave function collapses and you just pick up that particular amplitude and this is what Einstein found unacceptable or weird and I guess uh, some people still do, okay? So people even talk about many words interpretation and so on, but you know, my view is that interpretation is not needed. This is what happens experimentally. We have to accept it. Now here is the first thing that even the experts may not know. So an experiment was proposed by John Wheeler a uh, long, long time ago, which is called delayed choice. So this is connected with the experiment I was talking about that, okay, the electron can go through this slit or this slit. Now modern electronics is very, very fast. So, so this experiment is done with photon, not with electron. Modern ex electronics is fast enough that if you make these paths long, then you can choose where, how you're gonna do the measurement after sending the photon out. So you choose, you can choose that you're gonna do the measurement here so the photon can go through both slits. Or you can choose you're just gonna do the measurement here so the photon can only come through here. And you can make this choice after you have sent the photon out. So John Wheeler thought that this will be an absolute definitive uh, proof of uh, whether uh, um, uh, quantum mechanics really works or not. Of course, when he proposed it in mid 50s, this was a total fantasy, you know, like <laughs> quantum computer. Nobody thought this experiment could be done. This experiment has been actually done by many groups Starting in 2006, the, you know, that's, when, that's when the electronics, the relays and so on, were fast enough to do that. And you know what? Quantum mechanics is exactly as it should be. So the way they did the experiment, this is um, the schematic from the paper. So it is a single photon source, they needed a single photon source. And then they have two slits and, and they, have, they see some pattern, okay? And what they do is that they have two slits and after sending the photon, when the photon is somewhere here, they decide they're going to open the second slit. And they open the second slit, and they see a beautiful um, uh, interference pattern as they should. Now, in some other cases, what they do is that after sending it, they just close off one of these slits. They just put a shutter here. But way after the photon has gone through the two slits, they close that beam. You know, they just decide to close it afterward. The choice is made afterwards. And then what do they see? Well, what they see is, you know, so this is how it was done. They use these mirrors, and basically they can just shut it off where they're, which one they're looking at. They can make it reflect to this or this or both. And the result of the experiment is when they allow both the slits to be active, they see beautiful interference pattern. And when they make the delayed choice of shutting it off, it doesn't matter which one they're shutting off, blue and red are each different one, this is what they see really like um, a particle pattern. And my understanding is uh, these, ex these are the experiments that experimenters love very much because this is guaranteed to be in science and nature because this is like very weird. And uh, there are several, several papers on this uh, improving because you can see there is some precision. You can say, oh, maybe there is a little interference pattern here. So you can keep on improving the error bar. I don't remember the error bar. It's very, very small now that the delayed choice experiment shows total triumph of quantum mechanics. What happens if you have three or more slits? This is something else experts may not know. Uh, so is there anything beyond two slits, okay? Is, is multi-slit, does multi-slit have more surprise? So let's consider a three-slit interference experiment. So now you have many possibilities, right? It can go to one, two, two, three, one, three, and then you have to subtract out the thing going to one, two, three. Both classical and quantum will give you this probability. And then you can say, okay, now you can have interference pattern with one, two slits open, one, three slits open, and for four slit pattern I can go, I can even make it more complex because now I have many possibilities. Three slits open, one closed, all of them open, and you can write down the classical or quantum probability of what it would happen. It turns out, <laughs> let me just give you, it's just algebra, but, uh, but it's, it turns out there is nothing new behind two slit. You know, multi-slit doesn't give you any new physics. It's exactly two slick, nothing new beyond two slick, no multipath interference beyond just double path interference. So, uh, so, so beyond two slick, once you accept that two slick interference, classical and quantum give you 
uh, they give you exactly the same prediction. And this came out of the science paper three years ago. Um, I learned about it because Ray Laflamme was visiting Maryland and um, he told me that this experiment was going on. And then he told me the experiment is successful. And again, there is some error bar, but the error bar is very, very small. So these are things people are still very, very interested in. So, you know, so water ripples from this kind of interference pattern, electron interference is the same. We can, in solid state systems now, people have done um, beautiful experiments where you have iron atoms on a copper surface. So this is false image. What you're seeing is they have all kinds of name, quantum coral, quantum stadium. So this is, you can go on the internet and there is an IBM STM gallery, beautiful, many beautiful pictures like that, all real images, real false color image of quantum interference of some kind of atoms patterned on some kind of substrates. So I'm showing you iron atoms and copper surfaces. Look how beautiful this quantum interference pattern is. Really looks like waves. This is Bose-Einstein condensate interfering. This is the original uh, um, experimental paper that um, from GILA. So here is constructive interference. See lots of peaks, a destructive interference. There is nothing. So here, something like 10,000 atoms working at a single quantum system. So the interference is between two quantum systems, each of which is roughly 10,000 atoms. So, you know, so uh, these are the things that, uh, that quantum mechanics is. Wave function collapse is, the, is, of course, the big deal in the last 10 minutes. That's all I'll talk about. So the question that people had, Einstein asked, is can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete? Okay, so what is completeness here? What is meant by complete? So Einstein defined completeness absolutely precisely. Very classical definition. Every element of the physical reality must have a counterpart in the physical theory. So he's saying if you're doing an experiment, everything you can measure should have a counterpart in a physical theory. If, and this is the key sentence, this we all accept. If, without, any, without in any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty, that is with probability equal to unity, the value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to the physical quantity. It's a very, you know, very profound philosophical statement, which is really a statement of physics. And, um, and if you have followed einstein bohr correspondence on this, there are whole books on it, it's clear that Bohr did not understand this. And I'm making a very strong statement, but it's true. When you look at it, all Bohr's response to Einstein kind of avoided this key thing. It's only John Bell eventually answered Einstein's question and showed that Einstein's definition of physical reality doesn't apply to quantum world, okay? Uh, or quantum world is completely non-local. Uh, since you don't like non-locality, you have to say that, um, that uh, this definition, I'm gonna to come to that, this definition of quantum, this definition of reality, which is classical reality, does not apply to quantum mechanics. He definitively showed that by this definition, there cannot be any local quantum reality whatsoever. Either quantum reality is horribly non-local, or local quantum mechanics cannot incorporate this nice classical view of objective reality. Most physicists don't like non-locality. Uh, Bell's own, uh, uh, own inclination was that uh, world is non-local. But most physicists believe that this definition of quantum reality is meaningless. Uh, world is local. And so what is going on here, I'm just gonna quickly explain EPR paradox that you take two atoms, let's say, which form a molecule and spin up and spin down, so it's a singlet state. And then you separate them completely, okay? So the initial state is spin up and down, so it's a singlet. And then you take them apart very far. You take one of them all the way to the end of the universe and measure the spin to be up. Well, if you measure the spin to be up, then you know with, and there is no decoherence, then you know with unit probability the spin of this is down since you started a singlet state. So what Einstein is saying, well, if you know with absolute certainty that this is spin down, then of course there must be a reality with this spin always. It doesn't matter whether you knew it or not. There must be a reality, it must have been something. Now, this way of saying it, which is what most popular, text, popular books do, is of course completely stupid, because this is true in classical physics also. It's like writing up and down on a piece of paper, and then, then breaking the piece of paper into two pieces, and taking up very far, and looking at it up, then you know the other one says down. You have done nothing. Okay, uh, almost all popular books say this is a great mystery. There's nothing mysterious in it, okay? This is classical world works exactly the same way. What is of course different is that in quantum world, you can measure spin in some other direction that you choose after you have taken it to the, you know, quasar, to the end of the universe, 
okay? You can then decide, no, you know what? I don't like to measure uh, z eigenstate. I'm going to measure in the x direction, x eigenstate. Well, quantum mechanics says that this thing then will be in the x eigenstate. That is mysterious, okay? It's like you say up and down, but then you go and see that it says red. And you say, ah, over there it says green. It's like the property itself changed. And that, of course, you know, Einstein didn't like. Einstein, of course. And so this is called entanglement, we all know. And by the way, this is a real thing. This is a resource. Real world has entanglement. Just as real world has entropy, free energy, we use that to make engines. You know, that's why cars run and we can make power. You know, whenever you understand some natural resource, some resource that nature actually possesses, we can make money out of it. Entanglement is a real resource. This is not made up thing, it's a real resource. And uh, trust me, somebody's gonna make money out of it. Maybe me, because I have five patterns on topological quantum computer. So it may even be me, okay? So, uh, so this is what bothered Einstein, okay? And the point is that this is not, we have to just accept it. This is the way the world is, quantum world is. And until you measure here, spin there is unknown. So the moon, there is really no moon when no one is looking in quantum world. And uh, you know, disliking it is, doesn't do any, you any good. This is the way it is. Uh, Schrodinger, I'm not gonna spend much time on it. Everybody knows that. This bothers Schrodinger enormously that because of this entanglement, if you take a situation, you have a cat, and you have this device where you have cyanide gas, and if a cosmic ray, cosmic particle goes through it, some tube is broken, cyanide gas comes out, the cat is dead, and you put the whole thing under a shroud. So now you'd say the cat is in this state where the detector is live, detector is off, cat is alive, detector is dead, a detector is on, cat is dead, this is entangled, and the cat is in the superposition state. And Schrodinger, being a great classical physicist, absolutely could not accept it. And he said, the cat is either alive or dead, and of course when you open the look at it, Quantum mechanics says it collapses into either dead or alive, that's what you see. And until you look at it, cat was both dead and alive. And this is of course meaningless classically, bothers Schrodinger enormously. And you know what, this is what bothered Tony Leggett. You know, when I asked Tony, why does he think quantum mechanics doesn't apply to macroscopic object? He said, because of this paradox. I guess it's because he was a classical, uh, uh, he was a classic undergraduate at, at Cambridge. He is totally bothered by it, he said this is, there is, you cannot talk your way out of this paradox. Until I talked to him, I did not take this seriously, but he believes that there is a largeness factor, which he now thinks, I think, 10 to the power 15 atoms, since the experiment has pushed it to 10 to the power 12, it's 10 to the power 15, and quantum mechanics, as we know, it does not apply beyond 10 to the power 15 atoms. <coughs> I mean, I think it's only crazy, I told him that, he's completely wrong, but this is what he believes. And since experiment has not pushed it beyond 10 to the power 15, he thinks there is a fundamental constant of nature we have not discovered. And that fundamental constant of nature is how many microscopic particles individually obey quantum mechanics, but when you put them together, does not because of this paradox. It's uh, very interesting, okay? I would, have been, I would have been much more disparaging about this thing if I didn't know about Tony Leggett's viewpoint, okay? Um, so, you know, so the, the, I mean, basically the moon is not there when one is, it sounds absurd, but it's true, that's the way quantum mechanics is. So, um, so in the quantum world, you can have local reality, which is not objective, objective reality, which is not local, or you can have other things which I think are just uh, words, you know, it really, uh, this is not strange, you know. Uh, this is strange only if you try to use classical language, because language is extremely limited. You know, language uh, is based on evolution. Evolution is very slow. So language has no power to describe quantum mechanics because you know, a million years ago or even 100 years ago, you did not need anything to describe a world where something could be particle or wave both or something could be entangled. So you know, our language fails us to describe this thing. So we say it's uh, unintuitive, but our math shows exactly what it is. And as I keep on saying that you know, reality is a very flaky thing. A reality of a frog, reality of a fly, reality of a snail, very different from our reality. So we should not attach too much significance to our reality. It's all a flaw of the language. So I come, go back to the statement of Schrodinger. We never experiment with just one electron or atom, small molecule. In thought experiments, we sometimes assume that we do. This invariant is ridiculous consequence. He's thinking of Schrodinger's cat paradox. But of course, 
Schrodinger was simply wrong on both counts. Experiments with individuals, atoms, ions, photons, electrons are routine in 2012, 2014. And CAT states can be routinely created in the laboratory by entangling individual quantum states in a well-controlled manner. This was, of course, a 2012 Nobel Prize to uh, Harosh and Wineland. Wineland did it with matter, ions. Harosh did it with photons. And they, this is, there are now many papers which show that, OK, the maximum number of particles they have put together to make CAT state, I think, Reinhard Blatt probably has the current record, about 14. But pure CAT states have been made with uh, up to 14 atoms individually. So um, it's not a CAT, not until about 23 atoms. But to solve a CAT is not an isolated system. CAT is a live object. To solve the problem of Schrodinger's par uh, paradox quantitatively, you have to solve the problem of the CAT coupled to the sun, because there is no life without the sun. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's not an isolated system. So talking about Schrodinger cat paradox doesn't make much sense. But if you go to the laboratory where you can isolate so you don't have decoherence problem, this has been done. These states are as good cat state as Schrodinger thought about. You can talk about Einstein's box, which is a slight variation on Schrodinger, not as vivid and uh, not something that these um, animal lovers are not going to come and attack you, um, cat dead or alive. So Einstein thought of a, bo a, a large box with a partition in the middle. You put a ball in there, and then you just let the partition go. So the ball will be there on the left or the right. Quantum mechanics still says that until you look at it, the ball is uh, in a linear superposition of left <coughs> or right, green or blue, linear superposition. And then you open a loop, and you find the ball is in one side. Quantum mechanics and classical are the same thing. That's collapse. Classically, you'd say that if you find the ball on this side, it was always on this side. Okay, That's what you'd say. Quantum mechanically, of course, that's not true. Quantum mechanically, it was on both sides together. And Einstein found that crazy. But this has real consequences. And these experiments are done routinely now. Routinely, absolutely. And you can do experiment of one electron in a double well system. This is called a charge qubit for technical reason. So electron could be here or there, just like this ball in two boxes. And it could be in either. And there are consequences of that that you can calculate. And here are FISRAB letters. It came out in FISRAB letters, so it has to be right. Uh, here it is, OK? I'm not going to explain the details. But the experiment has been done many, many times. I'm showing you one of the early experiments, one of the first one, Hirayama's group. But this is, this is a technique that is used for doing qubits that you know, Bart and I are part of a large grant to work on these qubits, where if what Einstein was saying was correct, there, Bart and I would not have the grant. OK, what Einstein was saying was correct. The whole point of our grant is that the electron can be in either place. Okay, And these are all these experiments. I'm not going to show you other, other experiments. But there are many, many, many experiments, You know, more than 500 experiments where people let this electron go back and forth. And its entanglement and its, the fact that it's both sides in both boxes are routinely verified. In fact, we use this as a technique. OK, so uh, Schrodinger was completely and manifestly wrong. All right, I'm coming to an end. So I will end. Uh, I only told you all the, problem, all the beautiful, elegant things of quantum mechanics. And I'm not going to repeat them. But I do want to tell you that um, uh, uh, you know, the fact that quantum mechanics rules modern technological reality, you know, and maybe quantum computer will come, is telling us we really understand quantum reality. It remains Ill Ill elusive only if you want to try to describe it in ordinary English language. And that's probably because it's less than 100 years old. And it's a very long time to explain something in ordinary words. Okay, And let's just take, quickly look at classical physics. Let me just skip quantum computation. It's, uh, it would have been on a very limited level anyway. Uh, you, you probably know it. And if you didn't, it will not help. But I want to just make one point before I end, that how intuitive is classical physics? Okay. Classical physics seems obvious and intuitive, even a little boring, right? That's what I'm saying. But if you think about it, classical physics is very, very non-intuitive. To me, it's actually more non-intuitive than quantum physics. Okay, we are used to it. For 400 years, we are doing it, and and so you know, an evolution has made us aware of it. Uh, there is nothing obvious about projectile motion being a parabola or Kepler's law. I mean, how does how does the sun know to attract the Earth? I mean, who tells the sun that go attract the Earth with one of our R square law? I mean, we accept it, it does. But if you think about it, it's not obvious at all. Action at a distance instantaneously, it's, it's very non-obvious, except that it has been going on for so many 
such a long time, and all of us had to do problems starting from elementary school on these things. So we accept it, okay? I mean, what is so obvious about celestial and terrestrial laws of physics are exactly the same. I mean, this was, of course, you know, the greatest triumph of theoretical physics that Newton realized that the apple falling here and the earth going on the sun obey the same laws, but I don't think there is anything obvious about this. Um, you know, Aristotle, for example, thought, and this ran supreme for 2,000 years, that to make something move, you gotta push it, because that's our everyday experience. To make something move, you have to push it. It's, you know, if you ask a baby, the baby will tell you to make something move, you have to push it. But you now accept that's not true. Newton told us that, no, no, things in motion always remain in motion. That's not intuitive. You then say, oh, there is friction and all these things. That's adding words. So I, I would contend that classical physics is equally unintuitive. You are using all kind of theoretical constructs to make it look obvious. So for 2,000 years, the belief was that you need a cause, that's the word uh, Aristotle used, to create motion, since this is our apparent everyday experience. Things move when they're pushed or pulled. But Newton Galileo claimed otherwise, and now it has, this has become our intuition. But it's not very intuitive, okay? So reality, in some sense, is relative. You know, we accept classical Newtonian reality as a given intuitive truth because we have had it for 400 years. And um, you know, after all, people first claimed that the art goes on the sun, were all burnt to death, right? So that was not obvious at all. Um, Charles didn't like it all. You know. So anyway, so uh, the fact that reality of an electron or a photon is very different from our every intuitive reality, I think is something that should not bother us at all. And people who keep on saying quantum reality is weird and very strange uh, should keep in mind that Newtonian reality is weird also uh, compared with 2,000 years of experience. And I'm gonna stop right there on time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very uh, exciting talk. So I think we can entertain some questions. Very elementary talk. Any questions from the audience? Actually, let, let me ask one question. Art has a question. Please. Uh, it's a comment. I, I mean, I don't, uh, obviously, I, I don't, obviously, I don't agree with Tony's view that there's a, a fundamental constant and that quantum mechanics will break down when you have more and, and more atoms. Uh, uh, I don't know if it describes the universe on the scale of uh, beyond what we can see, the gravitational horizon or whatever, but. And, I, and obviously it doesn't work. It has, something has to go wrong at the Planck scale. Absolutely. But all of the examples you gave didn't no. really no. counteract what, 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 uh, what Tony is trying to tell us. We, we, we've we've, we've de demonstrated beautifully that quantum mechanics does work for one atom, one electron, two electrons, or if you want to think about the Josephson effect or something, it's, it's working uh, at the level of 10 to the 23rd mm -hmm. electrons, but there could be a limit. I completely agree with you, which is why I do not disparage that anymore. No experiment uh, disagrees with Tony Leggett's, uh, Tony Leggett's belief. I personally don't agree with him is all, all I'm saying. And the other point you make, I did not touch upon that at all, is that of course it's quite possible that when you look at the universe in, in totality, where quantum mechanics must somehow be com combined with gravity, things could be completely different, okay? And, and, and then what is going on, you do not know. I'm talking about quantum mechanics in everyday solid state physics and atomic physics laboratory. I'm not talking about quantum mechanics of cosmology or string theory where things are, are going to be very, very different, but that's a totally different topic which have to be, has to be given by somebody completely different, not me. But I do agree with Bert that, uh, that uh, exper Tony's hypothesis is consistent with experiment, yeah. Meaning it's not, in, not inconsistent with experiments, yeah. Never will be. <laughs> exactly, because his original number of 10 is about 10. He has already moved to number 16. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very, you know, it's a very fresh perspective. At least he's not, um, he's not, uh, he's taking a different stand. But I did ask him that, does he have an alternative scheme? He said, no. He basically doesn't like the idea of quantum decoherence at all. He doesn't believe it solves anything. He believes it's just putting the problem under the rug. 
uh, that you know you decode, you connect it with the laboratory, then the laboratory is connected to the building, the building is connected with the city, the city is connected with the art, and you just keep on going and it doesn't solve the problem. And you know, I find this philosophical, so I asked him, can you think of an experiment that will distinguish it? Because any experiment I know, I can distinguish the observer from the observed. You know, there is no problem. I agree that thinking about it in the abstract, philosophically or in the abstract, it sounds like a very, uh, very uh, <laughs> subtle or difficult thing. You know, how can you separate out the observer from the observed? They're all part of the same universe. But if I do not think of quantum mechanics for the whole universe, that's for much smarter people to do. If I just think of quantum mechanics in the everyday laboratory, solid state physics, atomic physics, things I understand, I have not come across any experiment where one cannot distinguish the two. But I, yeah, I completely accept what Bert Halperin just said. I interrupted, you had a question, right? Yeah, my question is, uh, I mean, how about, well, because in our workshop, we are talking about all these topological states. Do you think that all these quantum topological states are the new element to quantum reality? Uh, yeah, but they are not uh, as new, or uh, they, I would not call them as radical as this uh, issue of entanglement, all those things. This is all under still quantum physics. What we are finding out is that, uh, that uh, phases of matter, before we thought that phases of matter are completely described by just order parameter, okay? And now we're understanding that is not true. There are non-local aspects in phases of matter who are local order parameter would not work. And uh, that, of course, we know in classical geometry very well, you know, that, that uh, topology that a donut and a coffee cup are the same. They are very different in many, both have one whole. We are finding out many quantum systems are like that, that non-local degrees of freedom, and you're struggling for a way to describe them and to classify them. But I would not say that that would shed any light, at least, you know, from my very low level view, I don't think that will shed any light on the question, this big question that is being asked. That, you know, that's exciting in its own turn, but I do not think that will touch upon this issue. Any other questions from the audience, of the students? Okay, if there's no other questions, then let's thank uh, Professor Shank Shankar again. That's Shamus.